Hey everybody and welcome to Truth Be Told. I'm Mike Gunn, appearing to you for the first time on video. Typically we do podcast style content, but we've added video as well, so I hope you enjoy it. I'm here with Thomas Fretwell, who is a tutor of theology at King's Divinity School. He is an author of the book, Who Am I? Human Identity in the Gospel and in a Confusing World. And he's also the producer of Theology and Apologetics podcast on all major streaming platforms. I am honored to be speaking with him about miracles today. Mr. Fretwell, would you please introduce yourself to us? Yes, thank you for that. So as, as Mike has said, I, I, uh, I teach theology at King's Evangelical Divinity School in the UK here. Uh, I'm also actually on, on the pastoral team at my local church. And I do quite a lot of itinerant speaking, uh, blogging, podcasting, um, currently just going through my PhD, doing my PhD, my doctoral work. I'm nearing the end of that now. So, um, yeah, so all, all of that, that's, that's my introduction, Micah. To start off, we have to get kind of to a, a base definition. It is a foundational thing, whether that be the creation of the universe or the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Miracles are incredibly important. So we need to define them in a way if we're going to have a discussion about this topic. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm glad we're having this discussion. Like you said, it, it's just fascinating from a theological point of view, but it's also uh, this huge apologetic value that can come from miracles. I'm sure we'll get into that a little bit later. But like you say, we do need to have a starting point. But actually, even that is quite a controversial topic within the, the field itself. So depending if you've ever, any of your listeners have ever read into this subject, you'll notice that there isn't actually a singly defined definition that all scholars or academics can agree upon. It very much, I found it very much depends on who you're talking to. You see a philosopher will have a slightly different definition than a historian, and a theologian will obviously have a slightly defini definition to the rest of them. Um, but what I want to focus on really is the purpose of miracles. So I, I think we need to actually have a threefold understanding we need to be uh, have a philosophical understanding we also need to understand the history and then something i'm going to keep coming back to throughout our discussion will be the theological context because that's how we know the meaning uh, the historical definition is how we understand whether we can actually identify if a miracle has occurred in the past and then the philosophical understanding is of course is it actually a, a metaphysical possibility that we can have miracles and to be honest like like you said briefly there that is where the conflict really lies because like you say people have these presuppositions to which they come to the evidence and they actually filter their evidence through those presuppositions and so sometimes when you're a christian discussing with a naturalist you can be present you think you're presenting really good evidence but they filter it through a naturalistic grid and they dismiss it and you, your conversation doesn't go any further so for I mean, let's just try and pin down a, a simple definition. And there's quite a few sure. that have been um, done that I like. I mean, obviously, David Hume, the famous skeptic, he famously <laughs> said that miracles are a violation of uh, natural laws or the laws of nature. And of course, there's been a lot of debate since he said that, but that's his definition. Um, I actually quite like Anthony Flew, who was the, the late atheist, famous uh, atheistic philosopher who um, very famously changed his view in the last few years of his life. Uh, he, he had a negative, um, a sort of negative definition where he said, uh, a miracle is something which would never happen if nature was left to its own device. And I quite like that. For me, I, I yeah. find that quite simple. But um, the one I, I really sort of will build upon is uh, a miracle is a, a special act of God that interrupts the natural course of events. So, yeah. I mean, that it's broad, it's simple. But I, I do think we need to have um, that. For me, a miracle is a divine act, not just unexplained natural phenomena or something like that. So I like to have a, a special act of God that interrupts the natural course of events. And that's probably a, a starting point, And we can build upon that and look at it from different angles. Uh, that would be exciting. Yeah, that's that's a great point, too. I think it's funny you start off with atheists and naturalists to define um, what we're talking about, which is strictly thought of as a theological study. Mm -hmm. But atheists have had a say in this for years. And honestly, if, if you're going to be talking to other Christians, um, maybe some will explain away miracles by natural ways. But in, in most cases, there's a broad acceptance that yes, miracles have happened in the past. They even potentially do happen now. Um, they can happen. God does work. So to start from the level of who you're talking with, I think is really, really important because you're meeting someone where they're at and saying these are accepted definitions by people that are already skeptics. So that's very important. And as well, you spoke to um, the purpose of miracles being important within the definition. What would you say then the purpose of miracles are? Because if it's just, if the definition is 
that it's somewhere where God um, interacts within nature, then I think the purpose then further defines that because if it's just arbitrary or happens here and there, um, I think you lose some of the some of the finesse of what actually we're talking about with this. Miracles without context are kind of arbitrary, and it's much harder to defend or even prove something in the, in that sense if they're just uh, how most people want to think of them, just a very random display of power in that sense. But actually, as we're talking about miracles from the Bible, we're given just a rich historical context actually through thousands of years of historical context that mm -hmm. makes them all the more meaningful to us but to, to actually sort of understand it we need to actually look at what the bible says and like, like i say one of the problems with this discussion like i mentioned those three categories philosophical historical or theological most people like to just have the conversation and stay in one of those areas right so you say you have the the the, the very metaphysical discussion with the philosophers and then you have the historical discussion, and then they, they leave the theolo theology to us. But I'm saying we need to have all three of those things to mm -hmm. present a strong, robust case for Christian theism, but also for miracles themselves. So the purpose of miracles, if you read the scriptures, you'll notice that obviously it's a supernatural worldview that's presupposed from the very first verse in the beginning, God. It, it doesn't necessarily argue for that. Not that there's anything wrong with giving good arguments. I'm all for that. But it presupposes it's a supernatural worldview. We have to remember that. Sometimes we are uh, tempted with apologetic discussion to almost try and show that we can play in their field, so to speak. Um, and, and we sort of imbibe this sort of post-enlightenment rationalism. And we don't want to really admit just quite how supernatural the worldview of the Bible is. There's nothing wrong with that, though. If we start doing that, we're going to get into problems because the Bible, uh, Christian, Christianity is a supernatural worldview. In the Bible, there are a few different words, three main words that are used, uh, translated for miracles or and there's three in Hebrew, three in Greek, but we won't sure. go through the languages. But basically, they're translated as sign, uh, wonder or power. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're translated miracle or power or miracle. So they are signs. That means they signify something. That there was a rich theological purpose. Yes, the power sometimes relates to the person who is doing them and it shows the power behind them, the source, you could say. Sometimes it's about the nature, um, the, just the awe and the wonder that these things are happening because even in the ancient world, they had an understanding of the natural laws in the sense that they, they could identify the regularly occurring principles of nature. And they could thus identify when something is not as they would expect, a rare occurrence, like we would say. But um, we, look, we look at it in the sense that we, we have the power, the wonder and the nature. And God is signifying something to us. They are trying to show something about either God's character, his holiness, his judgments. But primarily the ones we read about throughout the Gospels really is what where the discussion seems to lie what what did jesus do they mm. were done with a very specific purpose to prove who he was and that's the theological context and i, I never really want to get away from that when i'm discussing miracles yes we can go back into the old testament and, and talk about some of the, the you know the parting of the red sea and all these types of miracles but they are it's, it's, we understand you know the scroll of the book is written of him right the bible is on a, a progressive revelation towards the the fullness of revelation that we find in Jesus Christ. And, and then we come to say the book of Hebrews, I think it's Hebrews 2, 4, um, where it says God testified to them by signs, wonders, and various miracles. But the word he testified to that he was proving something right. through the very uh, doing of these miracles. And that's actually, that's where the treasure lies as far as I'm concerned in understanding what it was God was communicating through these things. Now, of course, that may be a secondary discussion if you're having a conversation with a naturalist, but it's one you definitely want to try and have at some point. Yeah, um, it's interesting. But, it's interesting that you bring up, you said, essentially, the fact that miracles have a purpose, by definition, a sign is something signifying something, it has a purpose. So by definition of having a purpose, we kind of get a better definition of a miracle, because it's not something arbitrary, it's not something just ununderstood, it's actually meant to be understood, it's meant to show yeah. something. And that I think, is something we miss when we go into these other realms of study, which I think is important, you know, to, to meet someone at their level is important, but, um, it's almost like we accept all the burden of proof on ourselves. If you were talking about life, for example, if you were talking to a biologist, you wouldn't be expected to explain life from a metaphysical point of view. It'd be strictly biological, but for some reason, 
Christians accept the burden of proof to be able to say, okay, well, apologetically, what are miracles? Uh, literarily, what are miracles? And all these different things that we have to try and explain. And sometimes it's important to just kind of get back to that trunk of the tree and be like, well, okay, look at the words themselves, signs, wonders. These things have purpose. They have meaning to them. They're not uh, something arbitrary. I think that is incredibly important. That probably gets lost out on. So a good good base to start with for sure. Yeah, I, just, I like what you said there about the burden of proof because I find this is an often an issue that comes up that we are sort of so on edge and so defensive that we shoulder every burden of proof. So we, we, we enter into these discussions and we basically just allow uh, – the person we're discussing to just fire questions at us. Why this, why this, why this? And we have to just stand there, defend, 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 defend. Right. But, and I always want to tell people, no, that that's not how this debate should go. If we are making a claim, then we can have a burden of proof to support that claim. But it's not like the naturalist or the skeptic is just in this, this is the trick that's often played on people. It, it seems to be that they try and pretend they're in this neutral zone, not making any definite statements and therefore shoulder no burden of proof. So, with um, our, our working definition, then that we'll obviously add on to as a discussion progresses, um, supernatural or the the possibility of the supernatural is a big part of this, and I think um, we can often make the mistake of going too broad with our definition because then people have questions like, okay, obviously we included God within our definition, but people will say, well, Satan then can do miracles because he interacts in a supernatural way. Can he? And if so, how? How is this different from what God does? Uh, oh, great question. I mean, I, I do find this question fascinating and, it, yeah. and it, it comes up like it doesn't come up in the, the so much the philosophical or the historical. This sure. is we are moving here more into an in-house discussion mm -hmm. because it, in, in a sense, the question presupposes the existence of supernatural beings such as Satan. Sure. And angels. So I do consider this more of a, a sort of theological in-house um, discussion. But this is why I wanted to be clear that. I actually see miracle as a divine act. Mm -hmm. Now, we have to understand that um, if we're going to use those terms we mentioned from the Bible, sign, power, and miracle, we do find those same words actually being applied to Satan in various instances. And we have the uh, the whole um, episode with uh, in Moses in Pharaoh's court with right. the with Exodus 7, I believe, and, on, and onwards, where they, they are able to replicate some of the early uh, miracles of Moses in, in that sense. We also have some some fairly strange verses in the New Testament, and uh, people differ obviously on their eschatological positions. But it seems to be in Second Thessalonians, you remember, Paul says that the coming of the lawless one will be in accord with the activity of Satan. This is where we have to be be clear on our angelology, angelology, as they they say in systematic theology. Um, Satan and God are not two opposing sides who are equal. So there, this is where the difference comes in. One is a created being, one is the uncreated creator, so to speak. So if the miracle that I defined it can only come from God in that sense, then no, Satan can't do miracles in that sense. But we know the, the words are a little bit more elastic that we find in the New Testament, as we've just read here. So I, I, the way I would answer it is to say that as a supernatural being, uh, I remember Christianity is a supernatural worldview. Mm -hmm. What we are actually seeing is um, satanic signs, counterfeit miracles, you could call them. You would say it's maybe a deceptive use of angelic power to deceive. This is actually where the occult, this is sort of getting you into what the occult actually is and why it's against us. Now, to, to our eyes from Earth, we, we don't understand many of that much about that realm and those powers. It could be very easily that we would mistake them for a miracle, just like we would if it was a divine miracle. If you yeah. see what I'm, see what I get there. But the actual power and working of it is not from the same source. Therefore, it is something different, as far as I'm concerned. So I actually call them satanic signs or counterfeit miracles. Um, but it does see the Bible does seem to indicate that they they will be a thing at some point. Jesus said, "False Christ and false prophets will arise, show signs and wonders, and listen, mislead many." Yeah, people will listen to that. And yeah. it's, it's. I think um, that's interesting. It's also um, going back to what you said about purpose of miracles too. So if you look uh, specifically at with Janus and Jambres um, going head to head with Moses in the court of Pharaoh, it's interesting to know 
to note that there's different purposes there. So even though the same exact thing is being done, even if um, spiritually the same exact thing is being done, right? Obviously the, the appearance to the people watching was the same thing happened. But let's say something was a little different. What It doesn't really matter. The purpose or the outcome is totally different because it shows that God is above those other gods. And yeah. so even in that, the purpose of the miracle happening or the purpose of the work or the sign was to signify something. Whereas with them, the signification was we can exalt ourselves above that God or with, with Satan, you know, that's, that's kind of his mm -hmm. overarching goal. So the purpose, when you, you, when you apply purpose to miracles, I think there's uh, something to be said for that because yeah, there is a, a distinct difference there. People often then, if, if they accept miracles, we'll, we'll get back to naturalists and, and a defense for miracles, but yeah. When people discuss miracles within Christianity, there's often a misunderstanding, I think, about what to do with that information. Should we expect miracles to happen? Or if they're not happening, is something wrong? Uh, should we should we ask for miracles? Or, or um, is this is this wrong to ask this of God? And, and certain examples, like in Luke 23, verse 8, Herod wants miracles, and it's from Christ. And it's clearly like, okay, he has the wrong motive here. John 6, 26... Uh, mm -hmm. Jesus says the people should have followed me because of the signs, not because of the food I was giving them. You know, they they need that spiritual bread rather than yep. just the physical. So what advice would you give or what um, what outline could you give to better understand, like what our role is in in practical miracles? So should we expect miracles? Should we ask for them? Is it OK? So those texts you mentioned, uh, it, it's interesting. You, for me, you have to actually look at them case by case. That's why it's very hard to have a, a broad one size fits all understanding, because like you say, Herod's motives were very different to the disciples' motives, to right. motives. So the, the, there's a historical theological context for all of those things. Yeah, yeah. But talking about the, the miracles of Jesus, let's just use that as an example. They all serve, and like we said before, just such a rich theological purpose. They were not just a random display of power. And when I speak to Christians, I, I sometimes get the impression they, they just want to see something powerful because it will help them, you know, to really believe. And I have a bit of a problem with that because it, it's almost like if, if you don't believe the witness of the Holy Spirit through the word of God, you don't believe that Christ was resurrected, then I'm not sure what one dramatic miracle is going to do except sort of tantalize you a little bit. Yeah. Um, now, and I think that's what Herod was after. He wanted that. He wanted to see this person perform the act of power and then I'd, i'm guessing that he probably wanted to have a conversation in private and see how he could get that same power we see something similar yeah. in the book of acts when the apostles are doing miracles don't we with the, one of the magicians that yeah. follows them around this is the sort of thing that's happening but the actual miracles of christ and, the, and let me just digress and give you an example here because i think it will help people to really really sh show you how we have to root our understanding within biblical theology as christians that's what we need to do so christ's miracles there, there are three miracles i believe that the rabbis taught were messianic miracles that means they were things that only the messiah would be doing so it wasn't like we just had this this uh, incarnate deity walking around randomly doing things everything was structured with a purpose and with a context and the messianic miracles were the healing of a leper we find that in Matthew chapter 8 uh, the casting of a, a demon from the mute man uh, where that's in Matthew in the gospels 12 I believe and then in John 9 the healing of the man born blind now these were actually messianic miracles they weren't just healings random healings the rabbis actually taught and they, they pulled it from Isaiah 35 let me just read it to you quickly it says then the eyes of the blind will be opened the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute will shout for joy for the waters will break forth in the wilderness. So that's a messianic prophecy from Isaiah hundreds of years earlier, as you know, which again provides just a deep uh, context to this miracle and makes the fulfillment of it much more impressive and a much easier thing to argue for miracles when they're predicted in advance. And then someone comes around and does them. So the, the sages of Israel in the first century were teaching that when the Messiah comes, he would do those three particular things and no one else would be able to do them. Was, was that then with their understanding the ultimate Messiah to come? Because I know they also had beliefs in um, other versions of Messiahs coming, whether those be um, high priests or uh, things like that. They, they did have Messiah um, just as a term for people that would save Israel in, in certain ways. So this was specifically the ultimate Messiah. Oh, yeah, the, Davi the coming Davidic king. This, this was uh, 
the Messiah. And again, the, the actual views of the Messianic, uh, you know, Messiah, son of David, Messiah, son of Joseph, uh, they had some different views. But generally, from this Isaiah text, they extrapolated that when the Messiah comes, the, the true the true Messiah, he will do these three miracles. So then what you see, and I want you to trace this through with me in the New Testament. Yeah. When Jesus performs the first Messianic miracle, what happens then is you notice in the text when you do this that little things are mentioned like a, a, a large gathering of Pharisees and doctors suddenly started to appear. And when you understand why this is happening, it, it always makes a note, oh, there was a delegation from Jerusalem that came down. And this is because a Messianic miracle, if someone was claiming to have performed one of these three Messianic miracles, the Sanhedrin had to send an investigation. They had to investigate messianic activity. Right. And this is why when Jesus heals the leper, he says, go and show yourself to the priest, because that will start the process, right. because that had never happened before in, in Israel at that time. So that would start the process. And then as you trace him around, you, you notice that an investigation from the Sanhedrin involved three elements. First, observation. They would just stand at the side and watch the messianic claimant. And then they would interrogate. And that's why you notice in some of the dialogues that they come and they ask him uh, some pretty tough questions. Yeah. And this, the, this is the, the investigatory party of the Pharisees asking these questions. And then they have to give a verdict. That's the final stage of the interrogation. Now, you remember um, when yeah, he cast out, uh, cast out the demon. And then you'll notice in the text, the people are asking, they say, can this be the son of David? And why are they asking that? because the very rabbis themselves had been teaching that this was something only the son of David would be able to do. So they're asking, can this be the son of David? And then they're not asking just amongst themselves. They are asking the leadership of Israel as the leaders. It was the leader's uh, job to make that final decision. And do you remember in Matthew 12, what do they do? They, they actually decide, right, we're going to make our decision. And they say, this man is doing his miracles by the power of Beelzebub. And I that, was just I was just thinking of that. I thought, man, that matches so much in line with with that. And even his family at the time thought he was crazy. Yeah. And, and they came to collect him of this uh, of the Sanhedrin investigation into a messianic miracle. So they actually that is what's known as the official rejection of the messiahship of Jesus by hmm. the nation of Israel at that time. And that is what resulted in the judgment of 70 AD. That is what we call the unforgivable sin, uh, in, my, in my view. That was what it was. That could not be changed now. And then you notice in the Gospels that from Matthew 12 to Matthew 13, his ministry changes completely. Mm -hmm. And then he starts speaking in parables, doesn't he? And we have, then we have him, and it's more focused on preparing his disciples for the Great Commission and for what we're going to find out through the rest of the New Testament. In the first stage, it's coming to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, doing these messianic miracles to prove and signify his... Uh, identity right. and then the leadership make that official declaration and they attribute his power to satan and that is the official rejection of his messiahship and when you when you have that framework the gospels will just open up to you every little phrase you'll be like this is this is just following this pattern all through the gospels and that's why when i say you have to have a theological context to miracles if this was just a random person going around claiming things and doing some powerful stuff that's impressive maybe but there were other people around doing that in first right. century Israel. They had their own miracle workers in that respect. But when it's fulfilling a prophecy that was predicted hundreds of years ago and could only be fulfilled by one person in one particular way, and he is the one doing that, that makes that a much more formidable opponent. You know, it's, it's harder to disprove that. And that's why uh, yeah, we have to just keep the theology of miracles together because ultimately it's about Jesus Christ. Um, right. Christianity is a worldview that's founded on a miracle, isn't it? The, the resurrection of Jesus yeah. Christ. That's ultimately where we want to head to with most conversations. But we have to have the history, the historical and the philosophical in place too. Um, so, sorry, I know that was a bit of a digression, but I, I love that stuff. I mean, it, it helps. For me, it just helps people open up the New Testament in new ways. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up because I think a lot of people notice the measured nature of Christ, right? He could have performed just mass miracles where whole cities were now successful and healthy and wealthy. And he didn't do that. You know, he's not there to preach a prosperity gospel. He was there to preach his gospel, which is very specific. But I, I think um, you'll notice too, in uh, Gamaliel speaks to it when he, he talks about other people rising up. And with that framework, you think, man, they might've done one of those miracles by chance or maybe by the power of Satan or, um, 
maybe just an illusion of a miracle and they're they have these people on their radar but then they don't measure up and Gamaliel says that if they're of God then you can't stop it and if they're not then they'll come to nothing so that I always thought that's that's kind of like a mic drop moment you know for the Sanhedrin it's just like with that context it brings that so much more to life that they had this process that they went through of confirming miracles and I think that actually speaks to the truth of what happened as well because um, they had to respond to something. So something happened biblically, you know, whether you can, whether you decide to conclude that they didn't, or whether you conclude that they did, something happened where these high up officials deign to, you know, wander out of their high houses and, uh, in- investigate what was going on here. So that I think is a proof unto itself beyond just being interesting. So no, definitely, definitely still within the realm of what we're discussing here. You, you have, free reign to go on any diversion you'd like to. Um, in, in the modern sense, though, with that, I, I think um, New Testament is a good place to stick because we can relate to it uh, a lot. Although um, it seems like a lot of miracles were happening and what we have recorded for us has a lot of miracles going on, there is this sense that um, they're not really going on now, and so to ask for them would be maybe against what God wants. Would you Would you agree with that, or is it okay um, you, you mentioned the, the heart of the person, and I think that that is very important with the Sanhedrin. Obviously, they saw everything in front of them, and not only were asking, they were not asking for deliverance from Christ, they were rejecting him entirely. But then you have Gideon with a good heart, Herod with maybe a bad heart. So would motives play into that, whether you ask for them or not, or if it's okay to expect them? Or I don't expect to necessarily see miracles like I did in the Gospel period. Um, there were different things happening in the in the history of Revelation at that point that d- demanded more confirmation through miracles. We've talked about it, the yeah. identity of Messiah being the, the, the chief one. However, um, we still have uh, commands in the Bible that maybe would indicate we should expect these things. So you think about in the book of James where it says, if anyone's sick, get the elders to pray for him. Now, that, that could be implying that through that, a miracle of healing will take place. I think if God chooses to have grace, display his grace again remember it's a sign a signal it's those three words still apply right it's a sign to show god's power uh, something to communicate one of his attributes or to uh, confirm the message and and quite often miracle reports in modern days do seem to accompany the preaching of the gospel to areas that maybe haven't been exposed to it in certain ways before and for me that would seem like quite a a a good way that the message would be confirmed um Very consistent. Yeah, it's consistent. consistent, Yeah. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it is, it is interesting how, and so often too, though, when miracles are reported, it's either to a place where you can, you can kind of see like, man, I could see where that was needed there. Or it's, man, that church has a lot of followers already. And that almost tricks people into thinking like, like we talked about, like hyper charismatic. um, I don't want to put a blanket statement on it, but where it's just, anything could be miraculous if you would just believe hard enough or if you you don't have enough faith if you're not having all of these miracles happen or our church raised someone from the dead so look at this stripe we now have or you know it's it's like a like a critical acclaim for themselves that they believe a miracle happened right there and that just speaks to not the right attitude yeah no I, I, and again I, I, i'm i'm very put off by a lot of what i see uh, within that area at the same time without denying the fact that I totally believe God is capable, God can and does do those things. I think that's an act of his grace if he does that and he will have his own purposes. But um, to be honest, I, I think post-resurrection, like when, when the resurrection happened, you know, the resurrection was such a monumental feature that, you know, as Paul says, you know, if Christ did not, ri- you know, if, if he did not rise, our faith is in vain sort of thing. Right. Like, We're the most pitiable. In itself, yeah, the, the miracle of all miracles, we could say, say it like that. That's the one that defeated death. Yeah. That's the one that helps that, you know, that's where we are, you know, incorporated into the body of Christ and the power of his resurrection. Um, so when we go out into the modern world, we are preaching the miracle of the resurrection of the cross and the resurrection together. Um, so when we see, I, I even believe when you see someone come to faith, you are in many ways witnessing a miracle because behind the scenes, or they part of the unseen realm in that, in that sense, you are, you are seeing someone who is being placed into the body of Christ who's doing raised up into the heavenlies with Christ. And that is all, um, efficacious by the power of the resurrection of Jesus. It says that nobody is uh, nobody comes to Christ unless the Father draws him. So clearly, that is God working 
in this world. So yeah, even, even in those things. And I think when you have that attitude of like, it's probably a good attitude to have where not, not that every single thing that happens in your life, you know, time and chance happens to us all. Yeah, but when you just, when you just notice that God is working things, you know, he is working even in things that we might not call miracles now. Um, it doesn't mean that God isn't involved. He doesn't have his hand in it. So to see God in places, almost like that, that servant with, I don't know if it was Elijah or Elisha, but he had that servant and he was kind of shaking about these armies around them. And he said, all right, God, show him what I see. There's angel armies all around. It's like, if you just have this perspective that God is and can work through all things, that's, that's a way better place to start. Uh, practically speaking, when you're looking for miracles, almost like, um, reminds me of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego when it's, they're about to be thrown in the fire and it's, it's like, yeah, God will deliver us. But if he doesn't, you know, even if he doesn't, I still believe on him. I still have faith in him. And that, that is the right attitude. I think that's incredibly important. How can we tell when a miracle has happened in the modern era versus something that's just time and chance, or maybe, um, something that is kind of just an illusion or, you know, meant, meant to mislead. As far as we need to look at some things, is it, can it be explained by natural process? There's nothing wrong with trying to look, you know, we don't want to be claiming miracle whether or not miracles. So we got to be careful. Yeah. But also, is it bringing glory to God? Is it attesting to a truth in the word of God? These are all things that we can uh, look at and take it on a claim by claim basis. Sh- should we be expecting this based on the word of God? Um, and these are all things we, ne- we need to look at. Now, a good example is if, the message being preached is clearly anti-biblical and there are miracles happen. For me, that's a huge red flag. Yeah. It almost um, reminds me of like the testing for prophets. Like the first thing is if they're preaching against what God's already said, then they're, they're of no account to you. So if you, if you're seeing something happen, that's, wow, this, this looks pretty convincing to me. It's like, well, that's great, but where is it leading you? I'd also just add on to that. If we, if we go back to what we talked about before, c- counterfeit miracles being a part of biblical revelation and an actual reality, then they are literally designed to try and counterfeit. That means they will have a, they will be trying to signify their own message. Right. And this will be the message of Satan, the lawless one that is talked about in the, in the Bible. So it will be an actual uh, antichrist or the word simply means against Christ. So it will actually be a message that might appear to be messianic, but is actually against Christ. This is the whole concept of, of, right. that, of that word. And therefore, the only safeguard against that is to just make sure that we know the message of Jesus Christ. And, right. and that is, we have to be biblically literate. You know, we have to spend time in the text, learn what it is he's saying, what he predicts, what he wants, what he loves. I mean, that is our safeguard, really, against false miracles. Yeah. We have to make sure that we're not emotionally driven. Yes, we have emotions, but we want, we want them to be anchored in the word of God and the message of Jesus Christ, because true miracles will always point to that. And if we know the message, we can see how it's pointing, and that helps us identify these things. We're going to move on kind of kind of more to the naturalists, sure. uh, a conversation you have with naturalists. Uh, from a Christian perspective, but um, I really think it's just valuable. And I I think you brought out a good point. It's important for Christians to study miracles um, and to understand what's happening when miracles are going on in the Bible, to be able to discern when that time comes, because things are going to be happening where the intent is to deceive you. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't have an understanding of what's happening here, it's not just a foundation for your faith, whether you believe, yes, God created the heavens and the earth. That is a miracle that happened. That is the supernatural creating the natural. Yes, Jesus Christ rose from the dead and our faith is anchored in that. But then for the future, things are going to come, prophetically speaking, that are going to need your discernment. So if you've just chalked it up to, well, they happened then, they don't happen so much now. I don't really need to worry about it. It's just a nice story to read in the Bible. This is exactly why we're having this discussion. It's not just for a Christian to a naturalist. It's a Christian to another Christian saying, hey, have we delved deep enough into this topic? So Absolutely. really, 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 really good point. So then then moving on to the discussion you would have um, with naturalists, I actually, I'm reading right now um, the Brothers Karamazov or Karamazov by Dostoyevsky. Yeah. Fantastic quote in that book. It says, in my opinion, miracles will, miracles will never confound a realist. It is not miracles that bring a realist to faith. A true realist, if he is not a believer, will always find in himself the strength and ability not to believe in miracles as well. 
and if a miracle stands before him as an irrefutable fact, he will sooner doubt his own senses than admit the fact. It's like, man, that that sounds absurd, right? Why would you deny your own senses, your own reasoning? But that's yeah. exactly the predicament we find ourselves in. So then why is this disbelief in the possibility of miracles a hindrance on people's belief in God? Why can't we believe in one and not the other? Yeah, so th this just opens up a massive topic. We could really spend the whole time on, on, sure. on this part of it. But the, for me, this is the foundational conflict. It's a worldview issue. As, as you may know, you can present good testimony, good evidence for miracles, but if they are hard-nosed empiricists or rationalists, that means that, that they have this worldview, this framework that they use to interpret reality. And if it does not allow for miracles, that is an, a supernatural act of a divine being, then they will not see one, doesn't matter how much evidence you present them. So this is a fundamental clash, and this is this is really, to borrow a phrase from uh, Alvin Plantinga, this is where the conflict really lies. This is a foundational worldview issue because we can have all the historical evidence, all the testimony we can present, the, the New Testament documents and all these things. And most, if they're not open to it, not even to weigh it because they automatically hear you say it and in their head they're thinking, but that's not possible, that's impossible within my understanding. And you hit this wall. Yeah. So you have to know sort of how to, to navigate around that. And of course, most of these things, I mean, I consider most of the naturalist objections to miracles that I've heard to be sort of warmed over Humean reasoning. They're very much drawing on the work of David Hume, mm -hmm. who made a number of very powerful arguments. I say powerful in the sense that they've been long lasting. They're still with us today in various different forms. Um, but as I read his work and I see his arguments and, and a lot of uh, philosophers, Christian and non-Christian, have come against what, what he wrote. Um, Hume's Abject Failure, I think, by John Ehrman is, is a very uh, impressive book that uh, dismantles Hume. But his reasoning, and, and ba basically, he was a naturalist. He was a hard-nosed empiricist epistemologically. David Hume. So uh, it, it really, I think, for all the, the evidence and the things he argues, he's got this fundamental worldview problem. Doesn't yeah. matter what anyone presented to him, he was going to rule out the evidence. And, and he makes this argument, it's almost an argument based on probability, in fact, that, that um, he argues against the incredibility of someone violating a natural law. And he pulls on his definition as, of miracles as a violation of natural laws there. And, and what he basically says is that because the, you know, we see the regularity of natural laws occurring all the time, therefore we should base our, a wise person would base their belief on the greater evidence and the great the evidence is always greater for the regular than it is for the rare and i mean it's quite a clever argument <laughs> because the way he makes it feel like to disagree with him you wouldn't be put in the wise people category right. but um he, he then he makes a statement from that where he he says because of those, that sort of argument and again i'm very very i'm not doing human justice here a lot of people sure are sure chirping, but for, <laughs> for time's sake um, he then says that there must therefore be a uniform experience against miracles. And that's really the foundation of his argument against miracles. It's a probability mm -hmm. argument. But, I mean, in response, I always like to point out, he's not really weighing evidence. And this is what we need to do. We weigh evidence. To me, it seems like he's counting it. And when you're using a sort of additional method, when you have something that's a, a regular occurrence, natural laws, and something that we're claiming is a is a rare occurrence, right. the addition to natural laws, I would say, for, from an, an outside force. Um, of course, if you're doing addition on that, you're going to have way more in one column than you are the other. And therefore, it doesn't really seem like the best way to actually come to a conclusion that that methodology is fraught with problem. Um, it, it's probability. We don't, you know, just because the odds of something seem very rare, that doesn't mean that there actually can't be evidence to show that, that it did happen. We do see things like that in, in the world. That it, That is a... Uh, a real situation that can occur but really it, it's all I, I actually have to admit I, I find it arguing without admitting the actual point that you've got this fundamental worldview problem lurking underneath and regardless of what is presented you're not going to accept that miracles can happen you're right. always going to come up with a different explanation so therefore that tells me that what we need to focus on our effort in is having the worldview conversation maybe before we start arguing about this particular miracle, that particular miracle. And I, and I believe actually when we preach the gospel, we do this because we know the word of God is living and active, it's powerful and it convicts and it can do that work. But we preach 
the resurrection. We preach the cross. So that's a miracle. That's a historical reality in, in the cross. And we also are preaching a theistic worldview. And that opens up the possibility of miracles. And that's why, again, this threefold chord that I like to say about how we present the case for Christian theism is always so important. And if you're discussing things with a naturalist and you're noticing that they're just rejecting some things without weighing them because of a you know a priori presupposition to naturalism or, or anti, they're against, they're anti-supernaturalistic, then that's where you want to focus your discussion. You want, you want to identify what's causing people to trip up and have that discussion there. Now, you might not go anywhere with that, but that's the place you want to have a discussion. I, I tend to, I love what C.S. Lewis said when he said, if you admit God, then you must admit miracles. Indeed, you have no security against it. And I, I think that's just absolutely right. Yeah, and that, that exa- exactly answers my question, I think, with that example. Because So my, my question is, why does disbelief in the possibility of miracles hinder people's belief in God? Well, because miracles are God working. So if you deny God working, then or you deny God, you deny God working. If you deny God working, then you've essentially um, removed God's ability to do anything or be of any consequence. So he could exist, but he's not doing anything. So it's it's irrelevant in their mind. And I, I like how you said too, sorry, just, just one quick point. I like how you said that he counted proofs rather than weighed them. This is similar to, you'll, you'll get into arguments about um, the resurrection and I'll say, well, the fact that the apostles were willing to die for their belief, be martyred for their belief in the resurrection is a proof. Here, here's a proof. And someone else will say, yes, but isn't it more likely that as a criminal, Jesus's body was just kind of lost in, in the shuffle? Well, that is that is one for one, right? You, you've given me an example of a claim. I've given you an example of a claim. But when weighing those claims, they don't exactly cancel out. Proof of the apostles dying for a belief is far stronger than just, well, but couldn't this have happened? And when you're getting into those kinds of discussions, like you said, maybe maybe focus more on worldview um, just to better understand where they're coming from as opposed to point for point. Because I think that does happen a lot beyond just just Hume talking. I think it happens with just your everyday person that yeah, happens to subscribe that, to that, naturalist that belief. Well filtered down now into the public sort of language and, and yeah. in quite a sort of post-Christian culture, very secularized culture, particularly here in the in the UK. So these things are coming up all the time. And I think we need to just give a, uh, to, again, talking through the in-house element of it. Uh, there's a danger, and you probably know it, it goes under many names, liberal theology or higher critical theology, that sort of back in the, you know, in the 19th century, when these critics were starting to apply higher critical methodology to the biblical text, one of the key components of that methodology was it was anti-supernaturalistic. You know, it was it was against the miracle concept of the Bible, which is why we started to see things like the inspiration of the text, things like naturalistic explanation of all the miracles. And they started to remove biblical scholars started to remove the supernatural element from the text, almost like they were trying to line up more with the rationalism of the of that part, you know, the post enlightenment era. Now, I'd say that was just such a big error. And we've seen the damage that that has caused in the church because the scripture, you know, <laughs> We have a supernatural worldview. There's no doubt about it in the scriptures. And so we don't need to be ashamed of that. In fact, that's, that was what makes our message so powerful. So uh, what would you say to someone then that um, is a naturalist that would say things like, and I think there's validity to this, back, back in, in biblical times, this was a more mystic people. They were more ready to um, see miracles. And so they saw them kind of like self-fulfilling prophecy, but that they're not actually real. They're just a product of, uh, a worldview at the time, because we have a worldview now. And like you said, it continues to be supernatural worldview. And that's very important to say, to not allow just, yes, that was a time period thing. And now we don't have that. But how, how would you argue that we can continue on that belief um, rather than it just being a time period thing? Sure. But again, I find that an interesting question. Actually, David Hume made a second argument against miracles, which was completely focused on the, the, the witnesses. Mm-hmm. And he basically <laughs> ruled out pretty much everyone as a valid witness unless they were from a you know Western university with a number of achievements <laughs> behind them. And again, not doing injustice there, but that's to, that's basically what he was saying there. And I, I find this thing to be quite a similar objection, sort of implying that everyone in the ancient world was not as clever as we are today. And now I know there's of course progression in many things, mm-hmm. and 
like you said, there's validity in the sense that, for example, uh, the Nordic religion, they believed that thunder was a sign of Thor, didn't they? Um, and we, of course, now understand the natural processes behind the weather, uh, and we know that that, that that was mistaken. This is why, again, the theological context of Christianity is very different, because we have the books and the prophecies hundreds of years in advance telling us what was going to happen. And God says, I'm going to tell you, declare the end from the beginning so that when things come to pass, you may know that I am he. So that just changes things completely. It's not just trying to uh, assign a divine uh, deity to um, a natural phenomena that we cannot explain. Um, you know, we want to do good observational science and use the, you know, a sort of naturalistic methodology to study the operational world. That's perfectly acceptable. But we also may, we don't rule out uh, theism or, or the possibility of miracles because of that. We allow them both. We actually want to be able to follow the evidence wherever it leads, whether that's to a divine or a non-divine cause. Um, so, so when we're when, when I, I kind of face that kind of argument, I, I immediately sense that there's a kind of uh, hang on from the, sort of the enlightenment rationalism hanging on in the background there almost that it's you know it was only ancient people or, or sort of underdeveloped parts of the world that would believe in those things we, we are we've had the scientific revolution now and we don't need those things uh, right. in response i i probably want to get into a conversation discussing how you know all of the you know believers who, who formulated the field the fields in the early scientific revolution were themselves pretty much uh, theists, and they right. definitely did not see their science conflicting with the belief in miracles. Uh, that's a good avenue to have a conversation about. And I would also say just today, um, it's just not true to the facts. Whilst, it, yes, there may be a majority in a secular culture like that, but you know, if you're talking globally, the actual hard-nosed naturalists are in a minority in the world. Now, of course, I'm not saying that all religious claims through all religions are the same, absolutely sure. not. But even within the Western sort of Christian environment, many people who affirm modern day miracles are extremely well, extremely well educated people. Um, so it, there's clearly, you can't just relate it all to saying it was in the past, we don't have it now, because we do have it now. So yeah. let's see what they explain about that, and then take the conversation from there. I think that is almost a ploy to just um, relate you to a more primitive culture and say, see, you're believing in something more primitive. What I find interesting, though, is it I was just discussing this with a friend after our discussion the other day. Um, I, I said, yeah, I mean, people bring up stuff like this. So so what do you say? And I thought about it for a minute. I thought, man, it took an, a whole enlightening period. It took years of scientific advancement and technological development to produce the same kind of thing that Jesus did with spit and mud. Like he's, he's unstopping someone's hearing with spit and mud, healing the blind. And we say, yeah, we can do that with like laser eye surgery and cochlear implants. Like that's fantastic. And I don't want to deny God's hand and blessing of, you know, being able to produce technology. But it, until we can get to the point where we can spit in the mud and make some clay and anoint someone's eyes and they're healed, I don't know that your advancement really counts for all that much. So that's not, that's outside the theological um, yeah. argumentation, but it, it definitely just, I think it's still a point to make that it's like, man, yes, we have this advancement that would seem miraculous to people back then, but Christ didn't have those advancements at his disposal to just perform a quick surgery on someone, and it seemed miraculous. He he very clearly outlines how he does some of these miracles, and they're in ways that we still couldn't do now, even after years of advancement. So, I don't know, just something to bring up, I think, with, if you yeah, were discussing this with someone. Interesting, yeah. Miracles are at the foundation of what we believe in some way or another, whether it be creation, whether it be the resurrection of Christ, the miracles we might see in our modern day um, as signs and as wonders pointing to God. So I think I think it's a very good place to start. Often it gets left out. Um, we kind of go through the argument for God's existence and then we kind of stop short. Um, but but I think this is one that maybe should be added to the list of things we discuss with people that are non-believers because it can be so limiting if you refuse the idea of miracles. And remember, we're not talking about proving absolutely that this miracle happened, maybe in this modern time or, or even in a historical time. We're just saying just to get someone to believe in the possibility or the probability of miracles is leaps and bounds. I think it speaks leaps and bounds and will in their conversation with you because it is kind of that 
that stumbling block for a lot of people. So should we focus on miracles and apologetics? Is that something you would find um, Christians should do? There is a good value to apologetic discussion in miracles, primarily, I think, because it actually can serve the purpose of opening up the listener to their own assumptions. A lot of the time, people don't realize that, they, that they've that they actually absorbed a naturalistic worldview just from their surroundings and from what they've been taught. And a discussion about something that stands so uh, in the face of a naturalistic worldview, like a supernatural act from a divine being, as miracle, miracles are, can actually open up the discussion. And from there, it allows you to present just that rich, robust, logically consistent case for Christian theism that we want to do. And this is what I would I would say. You want that threefold case, starting metaphysically with those philosophical arguments for the existence of God. We have a rich tradition of natural theology that offers some really good arguments for the existence of God. And when you present those to people, whether you're going to persuade them or not, you can at least get them maybe to admit that the possibility of miracles is a real situation if, if they can do that. This is what happened with Anthony Flew in some respects. And then from that, we need a good historical presentation because Christianity is rooted in history. Some of the events that we talk about, the cross, you know, these are very well confirmed historical events. So we need a historiography that's a, a method of historical research that that has in its toolkit ways that we can look at the documents, the witnesses and analyze and weigh all of these things without ruling out supernatural stuff beforehand. So we need philosophical, we need historical, and then also we do need ultimately, I believe, that case presentation of the resurrection. So if we're talking about apologetic and miracles, we want to present the case for the resurrection. That's ultimately where we want everyone to be. It's not, you're not going to do that all in one conversation necessarily. Sure. You may or you may not. Sometimes uh, a Greg Kokel always says you just plant a stone in someone's shoe to make them uncomfortable. That concept that, oh, maybe miracles can actually happen is maybe enough to do that. And you get them thinking about these things. And then you, it just opens up so many places that you can go. But you want to have the chief miracle, the miracle of all miracles, the resurrection of Christ. At, at the focus of either your own thinking on miracles and then you just want to pray that you get those opportunities to share it because remember in Romans what does it say Jesus was declared to be the son of God by power through the resurrection by the power of the resurrection and that you know we want to declare Jesus as the son of God we want to put the king on the throne and we want to present that divine king to the world and that that's what that is what all our conversations want to move towards. That is, yeah, that is a fantastic exposition. Just, just kind of roundly sums up exactly what we've been talking about today. I think it's just something to have in your tool belt. You know, it's just, it's something that, um, and at, at worst, what do you do? I think the worst thing you could possibly do when discussing this with someone that will disbelieve what you're saying is present a rational case for what you believe. Because anytime you can do that, I think anytime you're unashamed of, of the gospel message, anytime you're unashamed of God working, um, I, I think that's a credit to you, and it's also it's leaps and bounds towards someone maybe not believing you, but respecting you. And respect can turn into love, which can turn into belief, which can turn you know it's it just like you said, the rock in someone's shoe. That might be all you do, but then later on, maybe someone helps them with that rock. Maybe someone you know, and they're. Um, Absolutely. I just think it's yeah, miracles are not the. Um, the one thing that we need to discuss with them and then we can just stop the conversation. But I just think it's something to have in our tool belt that often gets overlooked as just, even within the Christian community as just, well, that's mystical or that's historical and it's not active theology, you know, and, and it really is active theology. Yeah, absolutely. Any last words for, for our viewers on miracles today? I would just say, uh, if you don't know the Lord, uh, pray, pray that he would reveal himself to you and you'll see, you'll see a miracle happen in your own life. And for those of us that know the Lord, let's make sure that we uh, we know his message. Therefore, we have tools to be able to discern these things. Well, everybody, that has been Truth Be Told with Thomas Fretwell discussing miracles. I appreciate all of you tuning in. Please continue to do so. Any amount of support you could offer me, whether through sharing, listening, um, telling a friend, anything like that is fantastic. Also, go over to Thomas Fretwell's Theology and Apologetics podcast. Fantastic content there. And give him some love and support as well. Uh, thank you so much for everything. You guys are a fantastic group of listeners, and I am honored and privileged to be able to just present anything to you at all. So until next time, keep on studying your Bibles and keep on thinking critically about it. And thank you so much again for listening in.